Ohio, Silly Gurke hier mal wieder am Start auf Laser Gurken Land, dem gratis erreichbaren Microsoft Server mit der IP 149.202.127.134 oder alternativ mittlerweile die Domain sillyhuhn.com. Ähm, ja, mit Z geschrieben. Äh, alles klar, wir joinen mal. Wir pumpen heute den DEFCON 26 Talk vom offiziellen DEFCON Conference äh, Channel von 2018. Ähm, Defcon 26, Sween, Sven, Svea, Sve, <lacht> ich Namen vorlesen, Hilfe, Svi, Sagi, Till, Inside the Science Factory. Um, ja, let's go. Link wie immer in der Beschreibung. Hoffentlich gehe ich in die richtige Richtung. Ja. These guys have some awesome things they're gonna show. Him and girl. <lacht> Okay. Um, so, um, with no further delay, please give a warm welcome to Sven, Till and Sogi presenting uh, at DEF CON 2016. Da ist kann nicht mal ein N drinnen. Warte, kann ich den Namen noch mal sagen, bitte? Uh, at DEF CON 26, inside the safe, fake science factory. Okay, ups. And, ich oh. and, and, Was oh. ist denn da oben? <lacht> Um, so, um, with no further delay, please give a warm welcome to Sven, Till and Sogi, ah, Sven. presenting uh, at DEF CON 26 Sven. inside the safe, fake science factory. Oh yeah, and if one falls over the other one because of the lav mics, um, um, I'll help them up, but uh, yeah, let's, let's get you guys untangled first. Was will ich denn mit einer Karotte jetzt hier? Alright, give him another round of applause. Karotte. So, hi, Defcon. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. Oh, this schon, is amazing. This is such an honor to speak in front of such a great audience here. Uh, my name is Till, such. Till Kraus. I'm a reporter and investigative journalist from the Süddeutsche Zeitung, uh, Germany. Ich wollte gerade das Jungen, das in deutschen Akzent hat, aber meine Akzent Check Detection ist schon ziemlich am Arsch. Sorry, Leute. Und das macht es sehr wichtig, 
that science is actually working, the whole process of scientific publication. Mm -hmm. So uh, about a year ago, I was uh, fairly far along with some research and a year ago being 2017, by the way. An abstract and some preliminary findings at a conference. So I found this one, the uh, 19th International Conference on Political Psychology. Um, submitted an abstract. It got accepted. We were pretty delighted with that. Um, and that's a fairly standard thing to do in academia so that you can discuss your results with peers and that forms like the rest of your decision on how you write the rest of the paper. So off I went to Copenhagen uh, in Denmark in October last year, excited about the conference, you know, kind of written it about the presentation. And um, this was the conference. Not, not a room in the conference, that's the conference. Mm. And, and all it's a bit leer Like, took me. Uh, but, um, I, I just thought, well, maybe that's like an admin error or something. Um, but then the talk started, and bearing in mind I submitted on political psychology, um, the talks before mine were on urban planning, advanced Islamic finance, I'm not even sure what that really is, robotics, farming, um, all sorts of things. You know, get there, they say, okay, you've got five minutes to present, five minutes, they, you know, before they said it was 20 minutes, so you get those five, it's like all of a sudden, you're thinking this is a little bit weird, what the fuck? Um, <laughs> so, this sort of shenanigans has actually got a name, as I found out. Um, I'm the sort of schmuck that goes to these sort of places, apparently. And it's called Predatory Publishing. And uh, Phil's going to talk to us a little bit more about that. So, Predatory Publishing, what is this? So, we try to nail it down to some sort of a formula based on Albert Einstein. Um, the euro Einstein? is empty square. So, this means that what predatory publishers are doing is they take something that is either scientific, like your talk, or something that is utterly non-scientific, they mix it all together to make a lot of money. And um, there's a definition for this, of course, so this is, this is kind of a broader, broader soci sociological problem, uh, where you see that those meetings are set up to appear, appear as if they are science, but they're not, because nobody's actually really looking at that, what, what, what people are publishing there. So, my question to you guys would be, who here is either scientist or has a scientific background and knows a little bit about that? Let's have a show of hands. All right, that's quite a few people, but for the, for the rest of us, I'd just give you a very brief tour of how publications in the scientific world usually work. So, you'll, in a good academic journal, you have an idea for a paper, you submit it, an editor checks it, and could either reject it straight away, or sends it to a process that is called peer review. Uh, so peer review is something where other scientists, other researchers who have some knowledge in that field um, look at your manuscript and make suggestions. They look, is the mythology okay? Is the data set okay? Are the conclusions in any way coherent? And uh, they read the paper, they make suggestions, and they can again reject it straight away if they say, nah, this doesn't make any sense, or they have it for revision. And a friend of mine who's a scientist, they, he calls the peer review a, a big pain in the ass, basically, because people always have some suggestions and, and it's a very, very long and painful process. It can, it can take months, so it goes back and forth. You can have to resubmit it, another peer review, another possibility of rejection. But then in the end, after a long time, it gets accepted. So a little disclaimer here, the peer review process as we know it from the big journals that you know of, either open access journals on the internet or printed journals, it is not a perfect process. Sometimes weird papers slip through. Uh, the, the companies who, who, who run those big publications, uh, that there's a big monopoly here, a lot of money to be made. So this is not a perfect system, but the whole idea of other scientists reviewing manuscripts still is kind of like the gold standard for academic publishing. So when you look at those predatory journals, things look quite a bit different. So the only thing they have in common is there is a submission, so somebody submits a paper there. Then you've got some superficial comments, if at all. Then you have to make a payment, and then it's accepted. So quite easy, right? 
Ist die da hinten jetzt noch wirklich? Das sieht so aus, wie als hätte jemand in WhatsApp all die Vorschläge angeklickt. Was it 
the World Academy of Science and Technology. And we hardly believed ourselves when they invited us for the conference. So we went to London, this is not this one, we went to London in, in January and presented there. And yeah, let's, let's see how Isabella Stein and uh, Christian Schreibaumer, how they did. And we really, we read it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if we get that one in. So, yes, the yeah. first one. It's, 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 it's edited a little bit. Uh, introduce us uh, shortly. It's my colleague, Isabella Stein, um, also from, from um, our University of Applied Sciences. See, here now is the relationship between our solution and the analysis of the memory bus. This is memory bus. <lacht> ich wüsste gerne mal, ob ich gecheckt habe, gecheckt hätte, ob das eine Trash-Präsentation ist. Weil jetzt lässt sich natürlich leicht drüber lachen, dass das alles crappy ist. Aber ich meine, wenn man wirklich da ist und die, die sehen schon serious aus. <lacht> Okay, sie müssen ein bisschen lachen. <lacht> Best Presentation Certificate, stark. So, <laughs> this one is uh, the organizer. Uh, this was the only person there who was from the World Academy of Science and Technology. And uh, I asked him, who are you? What's your name? And he barely, oh, he did not want to answer. He mumbled something like, I, I'm only a student from Cyprus. And, I don't know anything about this. And so we kind of, it stopped here um, in London because we, yeah, we could not find out who is that guy and who is behind was it. And this was also a time when we needed some help more from a hacker person to, to dive in first. So um, I called a, a friend of mine, um, Andrew McPherson, and Andrew McPherson's like employee number one of the server who make Multigo. I don't know if you've not heard of Multigo, it's kind of a, a tool for exploring relationships, and technical and non-technical contexts, and it's, it's pretty awesome. And the uh, creator of Multigo created this graphic for us because he was pretty excited by the talk too. So in order to try and find out a little bit more about who's behind this wasset.org organization, we plug this into uh, Multigo, rather than Andrew did on this occasion. And we run a transform that uh, shows um, entries from who is, and we found out that wasa.org was using Cloudflare, which is, you know, a, a little bit of a pain because it's a bit of a, a dead end. But not really. 
um, because what we found with LASIT.org is that it was using the same tracking cookie as uh, IASP.org, IASP.org, and LASIT.com. Um, then if we look at the IP ownership for those guys, we see it links to a guy called Bora Ardil. And Bora Ardil is the guy, uh, the student there, the student there, that uh, Svea met in London. Uh, Bora Ardil also posts some freaks under the name or the alias of uh, a Flowbus. And you can get some interesting information about the sort of the structure of the WASIT organization uh, by some of his posts from the free. So back to uh, Maltigo and looking at the who is information, we also see there um, that if we look at the uh, IOS.org, practiced this a million times, uh, it references a, a gentleman called uh, Kamel Ardil. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but this is the guy here. Uh, Kamel's really the sort of the, the um, top of the tree for WASIT.org. Uh, Wasit it's a family business. He's Boris' father. And there's another Ardil as well involved, three of them, we think. Um, if we look at Bora, he's also um, registered uh, a ton of other conference type DNS names, 83 in total, like Conference University and Scientific Conference and stuff like that. So in total, WASIT uh, hosts about 13 events in 13 different cities each month. So they're quite busy, 5,000 conference conference. Uh, titles a month, a year, that's 157 events, 48 cities, 35 countries, and 53,467 conference titles in total. Anything you can think of, and if it's not there, there's an opportunity to suggest one. So we estimated based on about 20 to 25 submissions per um, event, that they're making, or the annual revenue is about 3.8 million euros a year or about four and a half million US dollars. Um, even if there are overheads for the hotel rooms, and they don't necessarily need to book the hotel conference rooms all day. My conference lasted two whole hours. Um, so even if it costs them two million, that's quite a lot of revenue uh, of profit that they're, they're making from, uh, from this. And this is just WASIT. Yeah, another video. Yeah, we... we we, of course, tried to speak with them about this, so we went to another conference in Berlin, but this time not German in the Berlin. radio and TV and to Deutsche Zeitung. Uh, we have several questions to you. Is this science? Is this science? Is Why was you you call this a scientific conference, so what is scientific about this conference? Matika was it of the IRC? Oh, so let me call yeah. the lawyer. Just yeah. let, let me call the lawyer. No, then no, you no. Face no, 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 you will face it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Federal police. Uh, <laughs> yes, German radio and TV and this was uh, the end of it, so we got thrown out. We we got thrown out, and we we did we didn't get any answers from them until today. So the only answers or the only information we have are the information we have from, from Chris. Okay, so after this encounter with these weird people and these weird conferences, we really thought, okay, let's, let's look deeper into what's going on there. We know that a lot of those conference organizers also have a, a publication arm where they publish journals and uh, scientific articles. So we thought, okay, if they accept any computer-generated nonsense, and you had a good laugh at that because you obviously were able to see what kind of crap that was, uh, let's see, to, let's try to put this on the next level, right? Let's try to have a scientific article published in one of their journals. So we really try to think, what would the bad guys do, right? So we try to have, a, a, we invented a cancer cure, complete nonsense, and had the goal to have it published in one of the journals so that we could say, well, this is a scientifically proven medication that we could then sell, for example, over the internet. Because who would buy just some random medication on the internet when you can buy one that says this is proven by scientists in a peer-reviewed journal? So what we did, we, for some reason, we liked bees because bees are awesome. Can bees heal cancer? Probably not. But who knows, right? In the world of scientific publications that are fake, anything's possible. So 
we invented another institution, the eFabier Institute. We made a Twitter account and a website. The Twitter account logo actually is the German symbol for recycling. So this was a little hint for the, for the trash that we're going to put out to the world. And the CEO of this is Dr. Richard Funden, which in Germany means erfunden, which means invented. So the whole thing was, 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 was pretty bad. And um, we submitted a paper to one of the, the journals from Omics, which is one of the biggest um, uh, um, companies in that field. The Journal of Integrated Oncology looks legit at a very first glance. So we wrote a paper saying that the wax that bees produce can have a better effect on cancer treatment than chemotherapy. So we just, we just said that, right? There was no proof. We said, oh yeah, we had some patients and we basically asked them as long as we wanted until they actually said, yeah, we feel better. This was our mythology. And um, we, <laughs> we made some <laughs> other outrageous claims. Um, for example, we said, well, one of the reasons why bees may be a good you know, therapy option for cancer patients is because bees don't get cancer. <laughs> right? Makes perfect sense. Um, the other argument we had was that, well, the general nature of bees, you know, how they fly around and those are really happy animals, that pretty much suggests that they're probably a good way to treat cancer. And we even, because we're scientists, we quoted a book, you know? We just didn't say that bees have a very, very happy nature. We looked it up in a book and we quoted it in the reference section. The only problem is, it's a children's book, right? Let be. So, we really, we really try to make it low stake so that anybody, yeah, not, yeah, not, not like the, the, a Nobel Prize winning scientist is needed to find out that this is utterly nonsense, right? But guess what happened? After a couple of days, we got review comments back from the publisher and they said, oh yeah, this provides important experimental and preclinical evidences. There was no evidence at all. It was just completely invented. Uh, they had some minor corrections that they didn't understand an abbreviation, what SITF means, which is not hard that they didn't understand because we just made it up. So we said, oh yeah, SITF stands for Signal Infer Transfer Protocol. And they said, oh sure, yeah, okay. And we got an email <laughs> about 10 days after we handed in the, sub the manuscript and the paper was accepted and published. Um, they wanted to have 2,000 euros, so two point something thousand dollars uh, publication fee, which we never paid, and they still publish the paper, so it's <laughs> online there, and it doesn't stop there. So uh, after a while, when the paper was online, we received several emails from other predatory publishers uh, inviting us to be editors at cancer journals, and one email that I put up on the screen here, we got invited to be keynote speakers at a breast cancer conference in Paris. So. What a career, right? We just invented this whole operation and within two weeks we had a scientific publication that we could put on the website and saying, this is officially peer reviewed. We were able to speak at a conference and we're editors of journals. So if we really had the plan to sell this fake medication, we would have some arguments now. And this sounds funny at first and believe us, we had a lot of fun doing this, but it's actually really serious because this is not something that we just made up. This is something that is really happening. So there are various medications or alleged medications out there which are proven in this journal. Yeah. For example, it, it did not took us a long time to find GCMAP. GCMAP um, is supposed to help against last stage cancer and a variety of other, other illnesses you, you, you may have. And, um, it is uh, something that you take it and then your immune system gets so strong that cancer is, is free. So, and they advertise with these studies really, yeah, quite often. So we just want to show or give you a short glimpse of what you can do with this study. Three hundred scientists from eight nations have written a hundred and fifty scientific research papers on GCMAP. Scientists, but we have written 32 of them. Yes, this is uh, uh, advertisement go on, go on, that is that will pay, and you will see now testimonials from this company. I took the GCMAP twice a week, and after three weeks, I started to feel less tired. It isn't, uh, 
something that's um, you know, just quite created just scientifically backed. So we will now have a short look into um, the studies. 300 scientists from eight nations have written 150 scientific research papers on GCMAP. This is so we have written 32 of them. With us. I took the GC map twice a week, and after three weeks, I started to feel less tired. It isn't um, something that's, um, you know, just quite great. It is scientifically backed. Hey. Okay. There we go. <laughs> it's a good advertisement, right? You can see it a couple of times. Science is from Yeah, can you make it snow? <laughs> but I think, I think you're getting the idea, right? So, uh, this is what makes this whole fake science operation so so dangerous that people can actually sit in front of a camera and say Jesus. this is quackery is scientifically backed. And I mean, let's be honest, who really has the background to double check those studies, right? Yes, and uh, here you see some of the studies from this com from from this um, from this com company, and these studies they are. And one of them is in the journal where Pill submitted the BWAX paper. Uh, others are in journals where we submitted a computer-generated fake paper. So you have no peer review or you have some kind of fake peer review because this is the only reason why these papers get, yeah, get published. So what we did was um, we showed this uh, study to um, quite a well-known oncologist in Germany. And she yeah, she, she reviewed these studies for a certain time and she said these studies are, are really terrible and that she thinks that a normal person can't see it. And even a doctor, if he's not very familiar with it, even a doctor can't see it. Because these studies, they, they only take care about single cases, for example. They are not scientifically at all and they should not have been published in any real journal. So her conclusion was that these studies only exist, um, that these internet pages where these products are sold can link to these scientific articles. And this is quite bad, especially for the patients when they are very, very ill and when they are searching hopelessly for some miracle or for some cure. And this is also the way how these studies are spreading over social media or over, um, yeah, over other media, over articles in, in media. So it also took us not long to find somebody who also spread the word. This is a very beloved um, TV host from Germany. She died in 2016 because she was severely ill. She had breast cancer in the last stage. And she wrote a book, and in this book, she, she really spoke very advertising and well about GC Math and that yeah, this is her last hope. We also spoke to her best friend and she told us that this was her last hope, this medication. And she was nobody who believed in some wonder healer or something. She believed in the studies because she read them by herself. So she died and on this case you really can see that this is a business with last hopes and that these people who are publishing these um, failed studies that they are making money with the hopes of um, dying people. So usually there are no consequences. In this case, luckily there are. So the one company who's selling that stuff is, is going to go on trial in London in November. And the files allege that they illegally sold GCMAP as a cancer drug based on failed studies. We also um, tried to reach out to them, but our, our questions were ignored. So what's the matter with all this? Many snake oil sellers, they can use this and then they can sell their stuff. We found plenty of other medications like some very, uh, some stem cell therapies um, which, which can't be working or some uh, a bioenergy healer who has 150 studies um, who heals with his energy. So there's plenty of them out there and they can sell their products because of these um, predatory publishers. So this was a reason, another reason for us to build a bigger picture. We wanted to know 
who else is there? And the first step was to write as many fake papers as we could and get them accepted at, I think, in the end, 12 different publisher. That one, this one was mine. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But to be honest, two or three papers did not get accepted, so that that works as well. One wrote back to us, uh, "This is meaningless. Do something. Do something better in the next future." So we felt some kind of didn't accept it, but the absolute majority accepted the paper without any comment. Oh uh, yeah. After we asked them, this publisher, why, why did you? Um, why did you accept this, or you are predatory? Most of them said no comment. Some said, no, we are not a predatory publisher, even if they accepted two papers from us. Or this one I, I, I like the most, they said, we are a platform, so we, we, we are not responsible. But yeah, we, we wanted to, to go and to dig deeper. Yeah, so to uh, gather some information from the various uh, predatory journals, we did some scraping and analyzing, or spider and scraping and analyzing on those. Um, Jesus. And we start off with scraping, which we divide into sort of two sections. So first is we want to look at the abstracts and papers that have been submitted and all of the information that goes with those. And the other thing we wanted to do was look at all of the conferences and where they are and how frequently. This is so him the first though, step eh? we did is like do some sort of site recon, and in this example, look at WASIT real quick. We get some ideas of this, uh, the site layout and what we want to um, our spiders to and what we want to scrape in a later part. So you see the papers and the abstracts are uh, listed here and they're linked to more detail. Um, and here you get things like the author name, the journal title, things like that. Um, and also you get this like unique identifier for the abstracts and they range from about zero to uh, 100,000. So you can write some, or I wrote some messy Python to just loop through all of those and download the HTML files, um, of which there are 53,069 for WASIT. Um, and then pull out the uh, meta, uh, metadata, the title, author, date, journal name, and stuff like that. Uh, and pass that all to a CSV file. There's no real magic there. Um, it was you know, quite straightforward. Um, the resultant abstract uh, CSV file had uh, all of the things we just saw, the paper ID, uh, had the uh, the author, stuff like that, and a direct download link to uh, the PDF, which would either be the PDF version of the abstract or the paper, and that those PDFs contained uh, more information, such as the institutions or the graph, and, um, and their email addresses. Yeah, I don't know, so any questions to them. PDF to text and pipe some of that information into abstracts of CSV as well. Others on the team um, preferred a slightly more elegant approach using um, scraping, for example, where you're really doing your sort of spidering and parsing all in one and you're getting your sort of uh, JSON file out of it. Uh, next, moving on to conferences real quick. Uh, there are 50 different sort of conference areas within uh, WASA and each of them linked to hundreds uh, yeah, together collectively thousands of, uh, of conference titles so 50 subject areas and here we see one subject area and that's just a small snippet of the different conferences in that subject area uh, in August 2018 and the reason why they all have those abbreviations you know you see like ICI something uh, that's done on purpose because legitimate uh, scientific conferences usually go by those acronyms. So what was it did is they just changed one of the letters around so that it that it almost sounded like the original conference, but not quite. And so this tricks people into believing, oh, I'm going to this very reputable conference, whereas it was just you know as valuable as a as, 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 as a Gucci bag written with one C. So you you could have been at uh, this conference, but you chose to come to DEFCON. Uh, now, just finished in Vancouver, and apparently they had scenes when uh, a lot of the attendees, the penny dropped for them. Um, so there was a bit of a backlash there, apparently. So altogether, there are 44,476 different conference titles you can select. There's going to be one for you. And if you're the kind of person that likes to plan in advance, Zweitausendeinunddreißig. Um, and look at all of the wonderful cities you could travel to. You'll get a receipt. 
um, and an attendance voucher and all of that sort of stuff. 2031. So we take um, what we did there with WASIT, but we applied that to all of the five um, uh, red well, that we okay. looked at. We get the JSON files, the CSV files, and we use a collection of tools to do various different analysis depending on who we were and what we were looking for. So Excel, Tableau, which is, uh, you can get a 15-day free license uh, or, or trial license for that, Neo4j for uh, graph visualization, and Curious, and of course like R and Python uh, as well. So on to uh, analyzing the data that we downloaded. Yes, it felt like r like lowering a curtain, like looking behind the scenes, because after the scraping process, we could finally say, okay, this is how big you are, this is how many abstracts you have. So we wanted to know how many authors. So we found nearly 180,000 abstracts and around 400,000 authors contributing to this scam worldwide. And uh, this, maybe some people would say, oh my God, stands in danger. So, no. So this is, if you compare it to the total number of scientists, with which are nearly 8 million scientists worldwide, this is still a very small proportion. Um, so most of the scientists are publishing in, in regular journals, open access journals or paper journals and only a very small proportion fell is for, for this scam. But the development is quite interesting. You see here that, especially with the big ones, omics and buzzards, that they have had quite an increase, especially in the last three to five years. They're getting bigger and bigger, making more money. And many people out there are saying that this is a problem from lower income countries. No, it's not. The US is the second biggest contributor to this consensus, especially omics with nearly 10,000 abstracts. And what is interesting if you dive deeper into the data when you are searching for universities or when you are looking for who is contributing to them, this goes in every field. There's nearly no university you won't find there. So even elite universities have published there over the past 10 years, I, I have to admit, so probably one can say, okay, this is not too much. But anyway, these are the numbers we, we pulled out of the metadata from the paper. I also did here for DEF CON, especially uh, top US institutions list, also out of interest, because I wanted to know which universities are on top of this list. Here is, it is an institution, it's the Mayo Clinic, I think it's pretty well-known institution, University of Michigan, Wayne State University. I wrote all of the universities you can read here. I, I wrote all of them, email, asked for their comment. Most of them did not comment on the issue. Some did. So one here I, I want to, to read. So they are really dismayed about this. They were really kind of concerned. And I, I talked to them on the phone. They were like, oh my god, we did not know this. And we, we don't like this, that our scientists are publishing there, and they want to take care and they want to take action to stop this and to warn and to inform their people about this. So most interesting is, what are the reasons why scientists do this? So first of all, scientists got scammed. We were talking about the Nigeria scam. So this is, they're sending spam emails and you fell for it accidentally. Then you go there once and then you see, okay, this is crap, you won't go there twice. Also, there's the publish or perish pressure in academia, so probably some people choose the easy way because it's just fast to publish there. And the third case, I want to go a little bit deeper because um, this is for us, it was the most interesting case when um, scientists are taking advantage of this predatory publishing. So we were lucky um, to find one case where there is, there is an investigation ongoing. Um, so we, uh, this is from CUNY University, City University of New York. And there are quite some professors who really like 
predatory publishers. So they don't publish their once or twice. No, 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 no. They publish their twice, times. So what you find in these papers, when you print them out, you will find that there's some kind of authors piling. You find that nine to 15 authors for one paper, which is um, not normal. Then all of these papers are grant funded. So this is usually taxpayers' money, which is in these papers. Then a lot of these papers is copy paste. So if you run this through a software, you really see that yeah, there, there's a lot of copy paste going on. And if you take them to a scientist to do a peer review, what he did, and edit, then they told us, okay, some of this what is in there is really scientifically questionable because probably they were written in a very short time. Um, we were lucky to have had a whistleblower who was familiar with this case, with this puny case, and he, he told us that professors can benefit from gaining higher salaries at promotions because they, they probably have some legit papers from, from good journals and then j they can just fill it up with this uh, cheap publications. Um, they can also can obtain other benefits and uh, this was the reason yeah, why, why this is, or this could be the reason why this is so liked for some, for minority um, of people. And which we find interesting mm -hmm. is that even if you do this knowingly or unknowingly, it doesn't really matter because you are feeding the system with this. The predatory publishers, they get the money from the universities, so this is one thing, and so they can grow with their business model. And the other thing is they get the reputation of the universities. They can advertise with oh, people from Stanford are publishing here, or people from Harvard are publishing here. So even if the scientists don't know, so even if they do this un unknowingly, they are helping the predatory publishing, and they are helping a different group where who will know more. Yeah, so when we looked at this, we, we thought, well, this goes way beyond academia, right? So it's one thing if professors try to, to polish their publication list, and get more money maybe or have a better reputation but this whole business can really be used for all kinds of purposes because we as a society we still have this kind of feeling that if something is scientifically proven it's kind of valuable and this is great that this is the case because usually science does exactly that but in the case of the predator uh, it is quite different so we not only look what academics are doing there but we looked what our companies and lobby groups and political influencers are doing there. Because in the end, big companies and big corporations have research and development departments where they present their own research uh, and their new products and all these kind of things. And oftentimes what they find is not really scientifically sound, but good enough for the predators, right? So one big branch, of course, the tobacco industry. Uh, they have a reputation, and I, I think most of you guys here know about this, they have a reputation for deceiving the public for, for decades, uh, trying to downplay the, the danger of secondhand smoking or the danger of smoking altogether. You probably know that spiel, right? It's like, oh, well, <laughs> that spiel? Is this an English word? Maybe one and maybe not. I don't know. Let's leave. You know, that's kind of what they do sometimes. And so what they do now, particularly Philip Morris is a company that we found there quite often, uh, the producer of Marlboro, you probably know them. So they, they, they start to revamp their business a little bit by selling uh, e-cigarettes uh, that are potentially less harmful, as they claim. They have scientists uh, writing about this, and where does the science sometimes end? In the predatory publishers. So they have those well-looking brochures that they hand out to investors and to the public, uh, where, they, where, they, where they make their health claims, and uh, they list the articles here as peer-reviewed, uh, and they are from Wazit. You know, they were published in Wazit, and we know what Wazit is, right? We got a best presentation award for reading a computer-generated nonsense paper there. So, well, not quite reputable, I guess. So, but this is not a one-time shot. Philip Morris seems to be quite a good customer for them. So they publish all kinds of studies in those non-peer-reviewed journals that claim to have a peer review. They go to conferences, present their, their research there, and particularly for the tobacco industry, it's interesting because for some serious academic conferences, they are banned. They're not even allowed to go there because of their history of deceiving the public. Uh, they're on a blacklist, so they just, it seems that they found another way to disseminate their research, to, to kind of 
boost their reputation. Who else is there? Pharmaceutical companies, the pharma giant Bayer from Germany, uh, inventor of aspirin, uh, they published there quite a few papers, and one of them is actually interesting because it, it actually has to do with aspirin, right? Their flagship product, um, because they want to sell different variations of aspirin. They have they come up with uh, aspirin plus C, which is basically just normal aspirin with vitamin plus C uh, added. Uh, they have a paper here claiming that this helps against the common cold, whereas many other scientists that we showed the paper say, well, this is not actually a legitimate claim. Uh, the German uh, Consumer Protection Agency actually says that the addition of vitamin C doesn't make any sense in this case, but you can sell it at a higher price. So if you are a consumer and you want to find out, oh, well, there's this normal aspirin and there's this aspirin plus C, you probably go to the internet, look up what the benefits are, and you end up here. So if you Google aspirin plus C, the omics paper, and let's keep in mind, this is non-peer-reviewed, this is just any, you know, any study you can publish there, is on the second rank on, on Google. So I think now with you guys actually looking it up and, and, and clicking on the link, you may actually make it rise to the top. <laughs> so I guess that's the collateral damage of a talk like this, but well, let's give this to Bayer, they can have it, okay. Um, so I, see, I think you, you understand what's going on here, right? Uh, other companies, Mullingrod, very controversial company that just recently been fined a hundred million dollars uh, for absurd and obscene increasement of the prices for the medications. They published there about the uh, medications there. AstraZeneca is doing it. Lobby groups, Ilse Europe, a think tank funded by Coca-Cola, Hershey's and Kellogg's, they sent their scientists over to a conference speaking about childhood obesity and nutrition. And guess what? It was not about salad. Right, so they use this kind of uh, forum to disseminate their research. What else did we find? We, we were kind of a run, right? We were typing in all the companies. So we found critical infrastructure. Framatome, a company that's responsible for the uh, nuclear safety, they published things there. Uh, at was it again, you know, the, uh, the, the company that we just saw. And it just goes on and on. The institutions from Germany, uh, basically tax, taxpayers' money goes up, they present their stuff there. Uh, and once you publish a scientific publication, it just doesn't end there, you know? So it, it's cited in other publications, other people, you know, cite it. It's cited in, in patents, for example, yeah, for somebody pa making patents on medical products. They cite was it publications there. And what we found particularly disturbing, there's this whole big group of climate change deniers, the, the CO2 coalition, for example, here in the United States, very, very controversial people. Uh, you've got the Eike Institute in Germany that is uh, scientifically uh, working together with the German right-wing party, AFD. Uh, they speak in front of parliaments in Germany, actually presenting their view that climate change is not man-made, this is all not a problem, and we should all you know, further invest in coal and all these kind of things. Uh, they use studies in those journals to back up their claims. So this is a very common strategy in, in scientific political propaganda that you say, well, look, on the one hand, you've got all those award-winning scientists, those great you know, thinkers who come up with their, with their theories and their proofs, but we've got other studies that just say a different, you know, that just say the opposite. And in this case, you could really prove that their arguments come from predatory publishers. And how do we know? Well, we just actually submitted a computer-generated nonsense paper at the exact same journal and got accepted like this. So in order to kind of conclude this first part, we really have to think again, what does science mean? And we got back to the slide from the beginning. So this is not just about you know your common professor doing a little bit of research on the side. Scientific progress is really a, and a super important driver for our society in the age of enlightenment and democracy. So what scientists find out influences not only political decisions, but what we buy, how we think, and how we see the world. And if you now, with the knowledge that you all have now about the predatory publishers, I think you see the danger that is in place there. Anything can be disseminated, anything can have the aura of science, nobody checks it, and when we confronted many universities, they were, absolutely, they were absolutely clueless. They have never heard of this problem before. And so the societies, those, those, those studies, they're spreading like viruses. You know, they're quoted here, they're quoted there. Lots of dangerous things are happening. Uh, you can, in the end, no longer distinguish fiction from fact. So the most terrible thing that could happen with this whole thing is that the trust that we have in science erodes. Because 
we think science is awesome. We think science is great. And when they do this thing, they, they really sell themselves at a very, very cheap price. And the, the trust that we have in science and progress may erode. You know, if, if, if more people publish in those journals, the trust is gone. And this would be really terrible. So in order to kind of combat this, we really made a long streak of investigative projects where we published the findings that we had together with 23 media partners and journalists around the world where we shared the data and people from other countries, be it Korea or India or the United States or Austria, uh, France, Jesus. they looked into specific cases from their country, <coughs> which universities Good, are there, sure which companies are there. Uh, Germany, from the 30 biggest companies, 12 had publications in those journals and this, this big kind of uh, publication really uh, had the aim to raise awareness. As I said, don't mess with him. Yeah. <laughs> it's oh. all because of, of Chris, yeah. Oh, of that comes right. So those are some of the results um, of the publications that came out, and there's more to come. The Guardian just ran a story today, and, and there's more coming up uh, for this in the future. So never end a talk without a call to action. That's what we learned, right? So uh, we're speaking in front of a very, very curious and interested audience here. So I think what, what you all can do is you can actually help to make this problem go away. When you find a study that somebody, some wacky person cites and says, oh, you know what, uh, autism doesn't exist, or uh, uh, um, you know, tobacco is not harmful, look where this published, uh, look where this study has been published, and if you find it to be from a predatory publisher, say so, and, and share, the, share the word. Um, spread the word about those, those, those companies. If you look up your university, or if you have academic friends, warn them, tell them that this is actually hurting science by publishing in those journals. And again, we know that academic publishing has its flaws, and, and, and even the established publishers do some mistakes, but what those predators are doing is really hurting everyone. So the big point is here, you all can help with this project because you don't even need the database and all those those files. Uh, this is just if you want to dive deeper. But if you have a, s uh, a simple Google string search that Svea is just about to tweet out on her account, um, if you enter any 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 word there, be it a university uh, email address that you know of, be it a controversial product that you have heard of, be it a controversial person or anything that you want, if you if you Google it through this, chances are really high that you will find if this comes from a predatory publisher or not. And look, uh, look for government. We found a lot of government in Germany. Yeah. So look for surveillance, because this would be very interesting if some surveillance stuff is sold with this with these studies. Yeah, the military is there sometimes too, right? Because all those people, they need publications, they need the, 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 the aura of science, and this is the cheap and easy way to do it. Oh yeah, there was, there was a dot .gov that just uh, submitted to the Vancouver conference that I just, just been, so you could look at that. So I think this concludes the first part of our presentation. There's, of course, this was a big research and a big work from a lot of people. So this whole project is more than the three people here. So we thank all the people on, on, on this chart and uh, good, dass da die end steht und the der noch eine Stunde geht. Just about to show. And um, the talk. Yeah, we are approachable on Twitter. If you find something, get in touch with us. We're, we'll hang around after the show here, of course. Uh, come talk to us. We share our knowledge. Uh, and we thank you very, very much for the attention. Uh, this has been great. This has been a pleasure. Thank Defcon, you. you guys rock. Hast du jetzt noch eine Stunde Fragen oder wie kann ich mir das vorstellen? So we'll, uh, we'll get the we'll get the documentary uh, we'll get the documentary set up. I mean, if those guys would have just given me my money back when I asked, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. that rug really tied the room together. Yeah. And so the documentary that we're showing now, of course, is, uh, uh, is subtitled, so you will understand it. And uh, if you have any questions now while we're setting up the laptop, we're, we're happy to answer. If there's a quick question, we have some time. So come, come in front or speak it out so yeah. loud. Yeah, say it loud so that we can hear it. I think there's a question here. Well, the, the question was from the papers that we looked up, how many of them were really legitimate? That is a very great question, and it, it, the answer is it's hard to tell, because only some of them that we really found out were 
seemingly really dangerous, for example, with the cancer medications, we gave them to other legitimate scientists to look them up. So we didn't, of course, control all of the papers and see how good they are, but we really think the problem is that it is almost impossible to tell the difference. So we kind of had the comparison, like in Germany, you have like a big um, institution that every car has to go there. I think it's like the DMV here or something, right? You get stickers on your car that checks if everything is okay. Those predatory publishers are like, like the DMV just putting the stickers on any car without looking at them. Most cars will probably be okay. Some of them will have exhumes that are poisonous and some of them won't have brakes because nobody looked at them. And this is the problem with those journals, that nobody looks at them, so the filtering function is gone. Now everything is science and everything is peer reviewed and you can't tell the difference. So uh, we, we invite everyone here to find papers and, and, and go for a hunt and look, uh, look it up. And if you have expert friends and you find a paper, show it to them and, and, and share, share the knowledge. So And if um, authors are publishing papers for these places, and kind of leaving them there. Uh, granted, sometimes it's hard to get your paper removed, so that's a factor, but if people are publishing there, which is kind of deceptive in its own right, then you have to then wonder, is the whole pool polluted? How was the research methodology and the data? We just don't know. And when there are um, open access and pre, uh, uh, was it pre pub paper, you know, uh, sites like uh, Archive and uh, OSF.io, you have to question why researchers aren't, aren't publishing there in, instead. So it's really difficult to sort of, sort of extract what's, what's real and what's not, and why people, what were people's motivations for publishing there. But we've got another question there, yeah, please. was how those business models of the conferences and the publications are, are intertwined. And, and the answer is yes, they are absolutely intertwined. Like for example, Omics, one of the, the, the key players in this, they offer both. They do a lot of conferences and they do a lot of journals. And there's currently actually an FTC investigation here in the United States against Omics because of their deceptive practices. And uh, so yes, a lot of people who publish there also go to the conferences. Of course, there are some separations as well. Some people only go to conferences, others only publish, but many do both. Full package, right? Another question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we actually, we researched one case in Germany uh, where we had a professor. And in Germany it is like, uh, you have to, to, to collect papers, and if you have enough paper, then you are a professor. And in this case, we found his, um, yeah, his work, and uh, a lot of his work was from predatory publishers, and he was a professor. He was actually a turbo professor, because he was very young. I think he actually had uh, two or three PhD degrees, and uh, he was a very young professor. And yeah, we called him, uh, yeah, <laughs> he yeah. sweated a lot. We, we did a lot of phone calls, we, we, we didn't publish his name, but if the people don't look closely, they may not see it, that it is published in predatory journals. <laughs> Poor guy. Yeah, there was also, I'm um, oh, sorry, question over there. Are we going to make the database available? Mm -hmm. Sorry. But we, we can't do this because um, it's a legal problem. Because in Germany, it is when you publish a person's name, then you first have to give him the opportunity to, to say something uh, for these allegations. Uh, and with 400,000 scientists, this would not be possible for us. So the only thing what we can do, and this is what we did here, um, is to publish this easy Google search so that everybody can check his institution. And um, we try to help um, people to do the scraping or probably to do a scraping project, put it on GitHub so that everybody 
can do it because we cannot publish the whole database um, in the web. Yeah, go on. So the question was, if we came across the fact that some of those journals, they actually list people there as editors or editorial board members, and yes, we, we came across tons of people who were just there, either who were already dead, <laughs> that happens, um, so not a lot of editorial work from their side, or um, people who are absolutely clueless about this, because you know, those website photos, they're public, they're, the CVs are public, so those predatory publishers just take the photos on the website, put them up there, and when we asked them, uh, we wrote emails to those people, we looked them up and said, did you know that you're a publisher there or an editor there? And a lot of people replied, I have never heard of this, and they tried now legal, legal steps to get their pictures removed, but we don't know how this will end. But with the scraping, the scraping code only uh, took the papers and the abstract. The scraping code did not include the editors, but what the scraping code, of course, included was um, paper who probably where people want to retract it, but 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 didn't get through it. So yes, of course, in the 400,000 scientists, there there might be a quota of people who is in there, but who definitely not want to be in there. And uh, there's a question over. So maybe over. let's take one or two more questions. I guess. Yeah, I think then one, one we will have more questions after the document. One more question. The guy has been standing patiently with his arm. Um, you. Yeah. the GC map case? Yeah, well, we're investigating still in, in, into the data, yeah, so there, there, there's, more, there's more stuff coming up there. But we really hope from input from other people, because some of those, some of those findings, you just have to come across them, you know? We don't know about any wonder drug that's sold in Minnesota or South Korea or wherever around the world those, those, those snake oil sellers do their business. So, yeah, of course, we still keep looking into these, into these uh, data sets and, and, and see what we can find. But since it's kind of easy to find those products, we really hope that other people pick it up and, 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 and do the work as well. Yeah, the Google search will get you quite far, actually. And the scraping is super easy, too. Um, Shall we roll the video? Yeah, so let's watch the film. It's like around 30 minutes, and we'll stick around and, and take more questions afterwards. Okay, Leute. Thanks. Ähm, ich denke, das ist jetzt eine gute erste Hälfte. Das dauert jetzt noch circa fast eine Stunde. Ähm, das war's dann mit dieser Episode und in der nächsten Episode geht es äh, dann weiter mit äh, DEFCON 26, Svea, äh, Till und äh, Sagi. Ähm, genau, das war Siligurke hier auf dem gratis erreichbaren Minecraft-Server Laserbrookenland mit der äh, Domain silihun.com alternativ die IP 1.9.2.1.7.1.3.4 und ich habe Angst vor diesen Viechern ähm, genau also sonst natürlich momentan noch die Domain silihun.com und wir sehen uns in der nächsten Dauerwerbesendung wo wir dann der 26 Sphere so geht in Seite Fake Science Factory weiterschauen okay tschüssi